Hi, welcome and thank you for spending time with us today to sharpen your skills in writing an abstract. My name is Kiki Fairfax and I'm an immunoparasitologist at the University of Utah. I'm a counselor for the American Committee of Molecular, Cellular and Immunoparasitology and a member of the Travel and Ward and Scientific Program Committees of ASTMH. In this video, we'll discuss the importance of abstracts. We'll talk about the right time to submit your abstract and we'll review tips for improving the content and structure of your abstract. Later, we'll take you through an exercise to analyze three versions of an abstract. These abstracts can be found on the annual meeting website where you found the link to this video. Please take some time to read each abstract, which will make the exercise that we'll go through in this video more meaningful. We'll conclude the video with a few slides on the process of planning for submitting an abstract to the ASTMH annual meeting and some resources available to you. All right, so what is an abstract? An abstract um, is a summary of information in a document or presentation. The question of course is why is an abstract important? An abstract is really a summary of all the information that you're presenting to different audiences. It gives you a snapshot or synthesis of the data and the research that you want to share and communicate with others. We find abstracts in many contexts in scientific communications, for instance, in manuscripts or journal articles. The abstract summarizes the key findings from your study. In grant proposals, an abstract is very important to summarize your ideas and to really engage reviewers as to why your research is important and why it should be funded. And we'll be talking about today, abstracts are also an important way of disseminating your research findings to different audiences at annual meetings and conferences such as the ASTMH annual meeting. So abstracts have two functions with respect to the annual meeting for ASTMH. The first is to interest the reviewers who will decide whether your abstract is accepted for presentation at the annual meeting. And then of course, whether the abstract will be accepted as an oral presentation or as a poster presentation. The abstract is also really important for the audience at the annual meeting as they try to decide which presentations they will attend. And if you have attended a meeting before, we typically have about 5,000 participants. Since the meeting features concurrent sessions and nearly 2,000 posters, it's always a challenge to try to decide on the itinerary for any individual person um, which posters and talks they'll attend. So, attendees really rely on the abstracts in the abstract book and online um, in the app to select the presentations that they want to attend. When you're writing your abstract, you want to ensure that it's concise and compelling for your story and it will pique a reviewer's interest as well as attendees' interests um, to attend your presentation. At the ASTMH annual meeting, we have two different types of scientific presentations. Symposia, uh, and scientific sessions. So the, I want to explain the difference between these two. Symposium sessions bring together a small group of scientists who present data on a specific theme or topic. The group identifies four speakers who will present very recent data on a particular topic, for example, on emerging drug resistance, and then they will submit a symposium proposal. These proposals are reviewed by the scientific program committee and are selected based on novelty and timelines of the information the diversity of speakers, and the anticipated level of interest to the attendee. Scientific sessions are different in the sense that they feature independent abstract presentations by one author, although there certainly can be co-authors on an abstract. These individual presentations are grouped together in seven abstracts per session on a related topic, but not necessarily all on the same topic. Um, an example would be we often have a session on malaria and one on schistosomiasis. Um, so these abstracts describe data that are focused on a particular research project or program from one or several labs. And these abstracts are also reviewed by the scientific program committee uh, for that topic area. This video will focus on abstract submission for scientific sessions. So the review process for abstracts for scientific sessions is conducted by the program committee. Within the program committee, we have individuals in subcommittees defined by their expertise. For example, I'm on the subcommittee for schistosomiasis. These subcommittees evaluate the abstracts and provide feedback with recommendations for which abstracts should be accepted for oral or poster presentations. 
In general, about 25% of all submitted abstracts are accepted for oral presentations. So one of the big questions that people face as they prepare their abstract is, is it really the right time to submit an abstract? Here are a few tips for making that decision and I encourage all of you to discuss your data with your supervisors and colleagues and other collaborators to make that decision together. The rule of thumb is to have enough data in order to answer the questions that you propose in the introduction of the abstract, um, but you don't have to have a complete story. The rule of thumb is that you wanna be confident about your core findings that you could set out in your abstract and that you ask this question and you're confident that you already have sufficient data to answer that question. But again, you don't have to have the story completely worked out. From the time of the abstract submission in April until the meeting in November, you can accumulate more data that supports your findings. And the additional data can be included in your presentation or poster for the meeting. But I wanna caution you against submitting an abstract where you anticipate having findings in time for the meeting, but you don't actually have those findings in hand. By the same token, you don't wanna submit an abstract based on work that was published several years ago, for example. If you submit published work, it really should be recently published. So again, the balancing act is you wanna be able in your abstract to talk about data you have on hand, knowing you can include more data by the time you have the meeting, but it, you don't want it to be a fully published story that has been out for multiple years. Stuff published uh, in 2021 and at the end of 2020 is definitely acceptable for this year. Okay, so we have two different abstract submission deadlines for the annual meeting. We have the regular abstract deadline um, that is in April, and then we have the late breaker abstract deadline in August. The purpose of the late breaker abstracts is to identify exciting and substantial data that has emerged since that original abstract deadline in April, because science is an ongoing process. Please don't rely on this as a backup for your, well, I'm not quite ready in April, so I'll wait into August. The goal really for ASTMH is to reserve the late breaker abstracts, particularly for oral presentations, to new data that is really hot off the press. The reason why I encourage you not to depend on that later deadline is because the acceptance rate for an oral presentation for late breaker abstracts is far lower than the regular submission deadline. For the April deadline, as I told you before, approximately 25% of abstracts will be selected for oral presentation, but only about 5% of late breaker abstracts are accepted for an oral presentation. Okay, so there are options when you're submitting your abstract, check if you want to have an oral presentation, that's a checkbox. So if you'd like to have an oral presentation, which is the most effective way of communicating your results to attendees, I'm gonna give you some tips to optimize your chances. Read the call for abstracts and the submission guidelines carefully and adhere to all the recommendations. You wanna ensure that your abstract includes adequate background information. So you want to set your study in context. For instance, you wanna address questions such as, what is currently known about this problem? Or what is the status of this particular issue in the field? What is your hypothesis? What is the rationale for your work? Next, you wanna provide a brief description of the methods, focus on your findings and provide conclusions that you draw from your findings. Another important piece of the abstract submission process is to use the correct abstract category. You will see a list of topics provided in the abstract submission site. So please give this some time, some consideration to ensure that you're submitting to the appropriate category. So here are the specific requirements for submitting your abstract. Abstracts must be submitted in English. Abstracts must be submitted in standard case, not in uppercase letters. And we really encourage you to avoid abbreviations and acronyms in your abstract. The character limit is 1850 characters, not including the title or authors. Accounting for space, abstract character limit is approximately 2,100 to 2,200 characters. Do not include tables or figures in your abstracts. So what makes a strong abstract? We want to tell a compelling story about our work. So we wanna present an interesting question that other researchers wanna know the answer to. You also want to explain the question or problem, how you have addressed it and what you found out. Very importantly, you wanna place it 
into context for the rest of the field, specifying how you address this problem and explain your particular findings. Essentially, you need to convince reviewers that other people will be interested to come and hear your presentation. That's what the program committee is looking for. Okay, so you want a compelling narrative that piques the interest of reviewers on the program committee and that they think a lot of attendees will be interested in coming to hear the presentation. So this slide is going to describe some of the common weaknesses that we see with abstracts that make them less likely to be accepted, particularly for an oral presentation. First, having only data and not setting your results within the context of the rest of the field can be a weakness because you're really just presenting a whole lot of data to the audience. It's not clear why this data is important, um, why you even did the study, why other people might be interested in the results. Okay. Remember, this is a large meeting with attendees from very different backgrounds, from basic science to global health and clinical work. So it's important to set the stage for your abstract, such as what is the problem and why is this important? Another weakness is to have too much data. You don't want to have to go into every study you've ever done, but rather you want to select your key findings that support your hypothesis or the question that you're asking. And then there are abstracts with no data. Avoid the temptation to say you'll have the data in time for the meeting, as I said a couple of slides ago. This will likely lead to your abstract not being accepted, certainly not for an oral presentation. We want to be sure that the abstracts that we are selecting for oral presentations uh, have clear data and a clear story that answers a question. Um, so you don't, those abstracts are not going to be chosen for oral presentations. Some of the other weaknesses we find in abstracts pertain to language. Avoid the use of abbreviations, acronyms, or jargon, which can make it very confusing for reviewers and people reading your abstract who are trying to decide to come to your poster or talk. Follow the rules and check your spelling and grammar. This is very important. If English is not your first language, we really recommend having a fluent English speaker or a native English speaker read your abstract and assure that the language is clear and accurate. This is really important because we have people um, from all over the world attend the meeting and listen to presentations and our common language is English. So let's talk about the structure of the abstract. First of all, the title is extremely important. The title should be specific and engaging. You should not have any acronyms in the title. And of course, you want to make sure that you list all the contributing authors. The first thing that a reviewer will read and the first thing an attendee will notice in the abstract book is the title, okay? That's what most people are making their decision as to whether or not they continue reading or they move on to another abstract. So the title needs to be specific and engaging. Try to avoid very descriptive titles that really don't say anything. Instead, try to get to the point with your abstract title. Do not use any acronyms in the title again, okay? Um, you want to be inclusive in your author list and ensure that you've included all your collaborators. When you circulate your abstract in advance of submission, make sure that all the authors have agreed to be included on the abstract and ensure that they are satisfied with the content of the abstract. In terms of the structure of the abstract, we recommend a structure called IMRAD, which is the acronym for introduction, methods, result, and discussion. The introduction, what was the question? What were you asking in the study? The method, how did you try to answer it? Go briefly into the methods and don't go into too much detail about the methods. You want just enough so that people understand how you set up the study. The results, what did you find? And finally, most importantly, the discussion. What does it mean? Why are the results important? The results section should loop back to the introduction where you set out the problem. You've now provided an answer to that problem and you wanna explain the difference of the results going forward. You'll find that at some meetings, we will require a conventional abstract which has no structure, just a single paragraph, no titles, and other meetings will ask for structure. For the ASTMH annual meeting, we require a conventional abstract. So we don't specify introduction methods and so on. Okay? But here's a pro tip. If you are writing your abstract, start off with the IMRAD structure so you actually write out an introduction, methods, results, discussion, then at the end, remove the headings and put the abstract all together. You've now incorporated all the key elements in your abstract, but without the headings. Voila, a 
perfect, informative, well-organized abstract. Here's a final point about verb tenses with abstracts that's also true with scientific writing in general and manuscripts. Use the first person when writing your abstract. For the methods and results sections, you'll use the past tense because those are experiments that you did in the past, and those are data that you collected in the past. For your introduction and discussion, you may include the use of the present tense, such as this is important to the field because of X, Y, and Z, but try to avoid using the future tense because it may convey to the readers, readers that you do not have the data that you plan, such as we will find this, we will analyze this. To a reviewer, this suggests that you don't have the data on hand, okay, which makes it a weaker abstract. We are now gonna move on to an abstract exercise where we will take you through three different examples of an abstract. I encourage you to read the abstracts before we move through this exercise. The abstracts can be found on the annual meeting website where you found the link to this video. So if you need to, pause the video, click on the link to go read the abstracts, and then come back and join me as we go through each individual abstract. All right, for this exercise, we've taken an abstract that was accepted to the meeting and modified it to create three different versions to help you identify common mistakes that are detected by the program committee. The abstracts will be displayed on screen here, and I encourage you to read through the abstracts before continuing on with this video. For each abstract, we'll critique the abstract format and look at the structure and talk about the hypothesis, the rationale, the methods, the findings, and the conclusions. We will then look at how much data is actually submitted and we'll ask ourselves, is the abstract filled with data that may not make a lot of sense? Is the abstract saying that you're going to talk about what you find in the next few months, but not really showing any concrete data at the time. These are very common mistakes that we talked about a couple slides ago that we will examine in these abstracts. So you have a concrete example. So here's abstract number one. It's called Modeling Malaria Genomics Reveals Transmission Decline and Rebound in Senegal. We wanna examine what worked in the abstract, what didn't work and what could be improved. Specifically, we wanna determine, is there too little data? Is there just the right amount of data? Is there too much data? Is the background sufficient or insufficient? Does the abstract contain jargon or not? Jargon is terminology that is technical and not necessarily explained. And as we said earlier, it's distracting to a general audience. So we wanna determine whether this abstract has appropriate levels of data, whether there's sufficient context or background, and whether or not jargon is being used in the terminology of the abstract itself. So take a few minutes to please read through this abstract. As you can see, the results of this poll suggested that there is too little data in this abstract. The abstract also contained a lot of description about what kind of data might be there, but not necessarily any amounts or quantitation or actual representation. So that's a good takeaway from this first abstract. In terms of the background data or the context, by far and away, a lot of people felt that we needed more context in order to understand the questions and why we're taking this approach. And then in terms of the jargon, it looks like a majority of people thought there was jargon. Appreciating that this may depend on your field of expertise, but remembering that the audience at ASTMH, although smart and very knowledgeable, might not know your particular field or your particular use of terminology. So it's something to be mindful of in terms of the jargon used. Let's go to the next abstract. We're gonna do the same thing for abstract number two and number three, and look at the results at the end in terms of these three versions of the same abstract. Here is abstract number two. So what worked, what didn't work, what could be approved? The second of the version of the abstract provides similar information. We give a few more details here in terms of numbers, but it follows the same format. Again, we wanna ask ourselves, is there sufficient background context, methodologies, findings, and conclusions? We wanna look at this abstract based on the same criteria as before. Thinking about this abstract with regard to the data, with regard to the background and the context of the jargon and terminology. So is there a use of terminology that might be very technical in nature and not necessarily defined? This is an opportunity for you to think about the 
data in terms of context and jargon. Take a moment to think about wanting to have not a flood of data, but enough data that you can say we've done things here. Looking at the background, do we have the context? Do we answer the why are we doing the experiment question? And think about the jargon. Do we explain some of the terms or do we overly use technical terms that might not be clear to everyone in the audience? The poll provides some different results with regard to data. About the same amount of people who thought there was too little data in the first abstract feel there's enough data here. With regard to the background, the poll indicates there's sufficient background provided to understand the question and the context. With respect to jargon, there's a predominant sense that there's still a use of jargon. So this is a problem for a broader smart scientific audience. There's still just a little too much for everybody to understand what's going on. The results indicate that the author could be more careful to explain some of the technical terms, giving more definition and clarification and using more common language, especially for people who may not necessarily know this field and discipline. So let's go to the third version of our abstract, which is similar in structure with similar information about genetic data and population information. Think about this abstract in terms of the amount of data that's provided, the background and context and use of jargon. When you're writing your abstract, make sure you consider how much data you actually include. We want to use concrete data. We don't want to be vague with our data. We don't want to overcomplicate it with lots of different data without ex explanation or context. We want to answer the question, does this abstract help our reader get a sense of the question or hypothesis? What is it we're trying to address? And think about whether we're using real technical inside terminology that's only familiar to people in this field and, dis and discipline, or are you using more inclusive language? So let's take a look at the poll. When we're looking at the poll, by far and away, it looks like people thought there was too much data. If you go back to the abstract, there's a lot of different kind of data, right? And there's lots of other kinds of information in there. So it's filled with all sorts of number and data, which are not necessarily related to the question posed in the abstract. The poll results indicate that there wasn't sufficient background. It didn't give the reader context. It didn't answer the questions. Why are you doing this work? What is your main question? Why is this important? The poll results indicated lots of jargon, technical terms, mutations, and things like that where the nomenclature is only comfortable for people working in that field, not to the broader, smart, intelligent, scientific audience that comes to the annual meeting, but might not know these particular terms. So as a reminder, you wanna make sure you're clarifying, defining, and using a common, comfortable scientific language. For the last polling question, we wanna ask ourselves, which abstract do you think was the strongest? Imagine you're on the scientific program committee and you have to decide among these three versions, which abstract is the most clear to the general audience at the annual meeting? Which abstract is going to provide the most information considering context and background information? And finally, how much data is provided and what is your sense of the use of jargon and the familiarity that people might have with the terms? By far and away, most people felt abstract number two was the strongest. That was indeed the abstract that was accepted by the program committee for an oral presentation in a recent year. That doesn't mean it's a perfect abstract. For example, the abstract probably has more jargon than needed and perhaps a better job could have been done with the context or hypothesis. This goes to show that every abstract can be improved and we encourage you to have others read your abstract, especially those outside of your field, to make sure that it's clear to them, a broader scientific audience. So here are two final slides with some information that we will hope will be useful to you about the process and planning for abstract submissions for this annual meeting. The submission deadline is April 21st. Remember to choose the correct category in the call for abstracts, there's a section with suggestions if your work crosses different categories. For instance, if your work spans global health and malaria, we suggest that you suggest, submit to the malaria category. Some abstracts will be reviewed by people with expertise in different categories if it is cross-cutting. And I would encourage you to present work that is cross-cutting. That is one of the most beneficial things about the annual meeting. 
Try your best to select the right category and read the guidelines in the call for abstracts for tips that will help you select the best category. Give some thought to your keywords when you submit your abstract. Keywords will be used for searches on Oasis in the app and online. This is sometimes done at the last minute where people just throw a few words down for keywords without them being really relevant uh, to the work. Shortly before the annual meeting, you can search the program online and many people take advantage of this before the meeting to plan out their itinerary. Keyword searches are used to search for presentations that directly relate to someone's work. So it's really important to select the correct keywords for your work. So rather than entering only the keyword malaria, which in any given meeting could be 50 abstracts, make sure that you select keywords that are very specific to your work. So instead of entering only the keyword malaria, include words that will help people find your abstract and miss the thousands of abstracts in the program. Make sure all of your authors have had time to review the abstract and give you feedback, especially if you're new to abstract writing. We really do encourage all trainees to give your authors at least one week to provide feedback and then give yourself time to incorporate the feedback in your revised abstract. For trainees, we also encourage you to submit your abstract for the Young Investigator Award competition and apply for travel awards. Down here are the links to apply for these awards. In terms of resources, some of the slides that we presented today were shared by AuthorAid. This is a very useful resource for those in developing countries and is linked here. They have a mentorship program that helps trainees with their writing, not just for abstracts, but also for manuscripts and grant proposals. And they have a number of PowerPoint presentations that are freely available on their website. This is another website on writing abstracts for scientific conferences that you can view for more tips that you can apply to your annual meeting abstract this year. And that's down here from Bioscience Writers. Thanks so much for your interest in the ASTMH abstract submission process. Please be sure to view the frequently asked questions about the abstract submission process, which of course you can find on our annual meeting webpage where you found the link to this video. Good luck with your abstract submission and we look forward to your participation in the annual meeting in November.